Riley spent nearly eight years at the national headquarters uh, of the American Red Cross, where he served in two critical leadership roles, first as the Senior Director of Congressional Affairs, and then as Director of Government Operations. He's a native of upstate New York and a graduate of Ithaca College. Please help me welcome Larry Decker. Good afternoon. good afternoon. This has been a good day. This has been a great day. Um, the past two weeks I've been flying around the country giving talks, uh, meeting with folks, uh, and um, quite frankly depressing the crap out of people uh, because they keep talking about Washington. And I hope that I don't do that today because my goal today is to energize this crowd to make you all recognize that even though there's so much stuff we have to deal with on a daily basis, we can still win this if we stick with it. So, with that said, thank you, California Free Thought. Thank you for being here. Thank you, people of reason, for coming out and understanding the importance of what's going on today and why we need to be vocal. This secular movement depends on secular Americans, uh, which is one of the reasons I'm so grateful to be speaking here today. Uh, the challenges that we're facing from the Trump administration, you're going to hear me use that name quite a bit today. Uh, I'll apologize to the president in advance. Uh, but what we're hearing from the challenges from the Trump administration, the 115th Congress, uh, and the religious right are truly unprecedented in our country. Over the past nine months, it's become apparent that they are determined to undo decades of hard-won progress. It is not an underestimation to say that if you're a woman, or if you're LGBTQ, or if you're a non-theist, or you're a member of a religious minority, you have fewer rights today than you did just two weeks ago. And that's because last Friday, the Attorney General, Jeff Beauregard Sessions, issued new religious liberty guidelines from the Department of Justice. The purpose of these guidelines is to guarantee that the Department of Justice will, to the fullest extent possible, impose and enforce the bigoted agenda of the religious right. Now I could spend the rest of my time talking just about those 25, uh, those 20 point principles that the Attorney General put out. Uh, but I'm just going to talk about a couple of them because you need to know how high the stakes are uh, and you need to know what the religious right is playing uh, right now and how they're playing for keeps. Among other things, this 25-page memo that the Attorney General put out rewrites the 1993 Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Already a terrible bill. It's already a terrible bill. There's 17 words in the United States Constitution in the First Amendment. We don't need a RIFRA. We've got the Constitution, but they're taking this already terrible bill from 1993 and they're rewriting it to adopt an indefensibly broad reading of the law. It includes a provision that says the government may not second guess the reasonableness of a religious belief, effectively turning religious belief into a get out of jail free card. In other words, I can say I believe this and the federal government can't question that belief. I just hide under that, that, that veil of religious freedom, that my belief is protected. So I can discriminate against a single mom or I can discriminate against a gay couple. But that's my belief. That's my religion. And it's legal, according to this attorney general. It allows tax-exempt churches to engage in electoral politics by instructing the IRS to not enforce the Johnson Amendment for churches. Now, we just heard uh, in the, not too long ago Julie from the local chapter of FFRF talking about the Johnson Amendment. That's what they're doing. They're not even waiting for the law to pass Congress. They're just taking it upon themselves. How brazen are these people? It opens the door for tax-funded, uh, taxpayer-funded discrimination 
by allowing the government to do business with federal contractors who religiously discriminate. President Barack Obama went out of his way to ensure that federal contractors had to follow the same federal employee standards uh, as, as uh, the, the contractors had to do the same as the federal government. The Department of Justice uh, on Friday, October 6th said, no, you don't. You don't have to do that anymore. So if you have a contractor that is a closely held corporation and the owners of that closely held corporation are religious, they can fire someone for being gay. They can deny a woman her right to uh, have prescription drugs uh, for her, her health care, for her reproductive health care. This is at the expense of our taxpayer dollars are going for this. It allows for sweeping discrimination by businesses and corporations. According to these guidelines, and get ready for this, Pharmacies could theoretically refuse to fill prescriptions for birth control. If the pharmacist doesn't like the birth control, if he doesn't believe in it, if he's a Catholic, and he doesn't believe in birth control, he can deny a woman uh, access to, to uh, that birth control. A hotel could refuse to rent a room to a same-sex couple. A funeral home could deny service to an atheist or someone belonging to a minority faith. The most critical sad time in a, in a family's lives, and they could be discriminated against by a funeral home. And show, you know, and it, 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 we all know that the case is coming before the court about the baker from Colorado and the gay couple, and you know, do I have to bake the cake? Do I have to bake the cake? Well, the administration already told us what their position is. And showing how bold the religious right has become, it even says religious institutions have a right to taxpayer money. In this memo, private religious schools could receive federal taxpayer money in the form of school vouchers. Churches damaged by natural disasters could receive federal funding for their repairs and reconstruction. That means that our government would literally be funding building churches. This is what we're up against, and this is why California Free Thought Day is so important. Because our democracy and our civil rights are under attack. And unless secular Americans come to their defense, they will be lost. Someone asked me yesterday if, if I was being an alarmist. And I wish I could say I was. But I mean, I sit in Washington, I watch this, I continue to see it go on, we continue to go up to the Hill and talk to members of Congress about it every single day. Uh, and this administration, even when they get pushback from members of their own party, just keeps plowing ahead and doing whatever the hell they want. So do I think I'm being an alarmist? No, I don't. We need more, however, than just resisting. We need to do more than just resist. We need to have a positive alternative. We need to be clear what we're fighting for. We're fighting for true religious freedom, the principle that all Americans should have the freedom of, but more importantly, the freedom from religion. We're fighting for equality that all Americans, regardless of race, gender, religion, or sexual orientation, all of us should have equal rights and equal protections. We're fighting for inclusion so that people of all faiths and none feel represented and respected by government that is elected by the people and for the people. And we're fighting for knowledge so that all Americans, especially young people, have the information they need to be empowered and confront the great challenges of the 21st century. These are our secular values. Freedom, inclusion, equality, knowledge. This is what we're fighting for, and it's everything that the religious right is fighting against. We need to be proud to articulate these values and never hesitate to put them on display against the religious right. Because despite everything that has happened, I know that the, mo the majority of Americans oppose the bigotry and religious zealotry that has ascended to power in Washington. 
And I want to actually highlight and ask to join me on stage two lawmakers who have courageously led by example and shown how secular values can be a positive force for change in our politics. Arizona State Senator Juan Mendez and State Representative Athena Salmon are both openly secular lawmakers who have never shied away from standing up for secular values and whose example we could all learn from. In 2013, <clears throat> Senator Mendez, who was then State Representative Mendez, offered the first ever secular invocation in the Arizona State House. It was a beautiful and powerful invocation that recognized the diversity of Arizona the common humanity that we all share. And it reminded the lawmakers listening of their responsibility to honor the Constitution and the secular equality it brings. Well, unfortunately, some of uh, Senator Mendez's former colleagues, including the majority leader of the Arizona House, decided that a secular invocation was unacceptable. So the very next day, the majority leader held a do-over. Uh, and uh, someone else gave an invocation by, it was a Christian pastor uh, asking for repentance for the secular invocation heard the day before. Forgive us, apparently. If the majority leader hoped that would put an end to secular invocations in the state house, he could not have been more wrong. For five years now in a row, a secular invocation has been offered in the Arizona state house. And that includes the one given earlier this year by State Representative Athena Salmon, the only open atheist female state lawmaker in the country. The only open atheist female lawmaker in the country. Like Senator Mendez's invocation, hers was uplifting, inclusive, and urged lawmakers to go forth and do good. And like Senator Mendez's invocation, the Speaker of the House publicly rebuked her and said it didn't qualify as a public invocation. In the face of this adversity, Representative Salmon did what the Speaker of the House could not do. She held a rally outside of the state capitol and invited representatives from a variety of faiths to speak about the importance of and, and inclusion uh, of religious freedom. That's what it looks like when we put our secular values into action and when we hold our values up against the religious right. I was tremendously honored earlier this year at our secular awards dinner in Washington, D.C. to honor my good friend Athena Salmon with our National Visibility Award, uh, an award that she so, so rightfully uh, has earned and deserves. Uh, and right now I'd like to ask if Senator Mendez and State Representative uh, Salmon would join me up on stage and say a few words. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? I really can't get over how beautiful this weather is. Um, so I want to thank, first of all, David Diskin for inviting me to speak today and Larry for connecting me to the California Free Th Thinkers. Thank you so much. So my name is Athena Salmon, and I represent Arizona's 26th legislative district in the State House of Representatives. I want everyone to pause and take a moment to recap what had happened earlier this year when I delivered the secular invocation on the 100th day of the Arizona State Legislative Session. Following my prayer, so I opened the day's business with a prayer, a secular prayer, and that's where the story should have ended, but unfortunately it did not. Following my prayer, my Republican male colleagues took turns to question my motives, supplant my prayer with the Christian one, and ultimately rule my invocation out of order. In the midst of it, two of my Democratic colleagues, both articulate Native American women, stood in my defense. Their speeches were moving. I was shook, I was shocked. I couldn't focus for the rest of that day. But with the help of local humanist Rob Lane, Evan Clark, 
and Tori Roberg, we and our local Secular Coalition affiliate decided that we needed to respond to this act of hate and organized a press conference titled Standing for Our First Freedom, Inspired by Our First Amendment Rights. We turned a moment of ugliness into an act of solidarity and love. The Phoenix Humanist community called upon interfaith allies, both locally and nationally, to support an atheist legislator. For the first time in my life, the leaders of diverse faiths, from Islam to Christianity, stood up for my rights as a non-religious individual. In fact, Yukwala, a member of the Havasupai tribe in the Grand Canyon, drove four hours one way to the press conference to include his words of support and then drove back immediately afterwards. The story is as much about me standing up for secular values in government as it is about our interfaith community standing up for an atheist. Imagine this story where atheists stood alone left to fend for themselves without solidarity. In fact, many of you have lived this story because for decades, the secular community has been standing alone asking for legitimacy and equality. And despite the derision and danger, this movement has been at the forefront of building the wall of protection between religion and government. Even as recently as 2013, when then Juan Mendez, representative, came out as an atheist on the floor of the Arizona State House. He stood largely alone. Exactly one reporter came to the press conference following his humanist invocation. There was no one from the faith community and just a handful of dedicated secularists. But between that first atheist invocation and my own, the secular movement in Arizona has grown strong and has become intersectional. Arizona Secular Coalition has been a mighty voice at the Capitol for LGBTQ rights and women's rights. We have stood alongside the religious community in supporting sanctuary for our immigrants. We have stood against the hate that targets the Muslim community. And we have stood the, for the religious freedom of all Arizonans. Because we have stood with the faith community, they have come to trust us. And by putting ourselves in the space of vulnerability, we are able to build strong relations with one, other, uh, with one another. And this is the space where love is born and our country is in desperate need of love right now. It is in the spirit of love that I ran for public office. Today, I stand before you as the only openly atheist female state legislator in the country out of 1,800 female legislators. And I'm also, thank you. Uh, and I'm also the first Palestinian American elected to serve in the Arizona State Legislature, and currently the only woman in my legislature under the age of 30 representing the people. <laughs> Rarely do people with my background get the opportunity to serve in elected office. Everyone knows, everyone here knows that feeling of isolation. Because regardless of your race, class, ability, sex, sex, sexual orientation, or gender, we are here together as atheists, as humanists, as agnostics. And to be an atheist or a secularist is to know the rarity in which we are publicly and positively acknowledged in the first place in anywhere in the world, including this country. One moment of recognition came in 2009 when then newly elected Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, delivered the graduation invocation at ASU, Arizona State. And I was moved to tears when he even mentioned the word atheist in his speech. It had never been done before, especially by a president. The overall problem with exclusion and discrimination, however, it keeps per, uh, perpetuating itself on multiple fronts due to the lack of diversity in positions of power, especially in elected office. We need look, to look no further than the state of representation in America to see how this oppression manifests itself. According to Represent 2020, a scorecard for immigrant leadership in America by the New American Leaders Project, while the United States population is 17% Latino, 5.6% Asian Pacific Islander, and 62% white, Congress is 81% white. In fact, only 
of the 500,000 available elected offices in the United States, only 2% of those are held by Asian Pacific Islanders and Latinos. Women comprise of over half the population of this country and make up only 19% of Congress. And there's never been a state legislature, not Arizona, not California, or any other state in the country that has ever been at 50% female representation. In fact, Arizona is the only legislature this year that has 40% in female representation. So how does this translate, translate into impact? Candidate diversity influences, first of all, which voters and which issues are prioritized in elections. Research shows that when voters see themselves re reflected in their elected officials, their participation and trust in government increases. In my district's primary alone, uh, voter turnout increased 30%, especially in precincts in my district that were dominated by people of color. Because of me, because of Juan, and because of our third running mate, strong Latina Isela Blanc. In government, a lack of a diversity also decides which positions are non-negotiable and which are compromisable. In simpler terms, if you don't have a seat at the dinner table, you are most definitely on the menu. Finally, a lack of diversity limits the potential of, pool, potential of pool of otherwise qualified and good candidates. This is both true in the public sector and the private sector. If you cannot see it, then how in the hell are you supposed to become it? As this country gets more diverse, as more women step up to lead, as more religious minorities, including atheists like Juan and me, demand equality, we confront head on a very real and strong backlash embedded in white male supremacy. Power does not relinquish itself without a fight. It is no coincidence that the rise of Donald Trump comes at the heels of the first black president in the history of the United States. Nor is it such that people chose to sit this election out rather than vote for a woman to become president. Donald Trump did not get more votes than Mitt Romney. People stayed home this election. Our president is attacking entire systems of faith, disparaging immigrants and people of color, demeaning women and LGBTQ individuals. His tirades are emboldening people who seek to cause psychological and physical harm to marginalized communities, as seen several months ago in Charlottesville. His false equivalency of neo-Nazis and terrorist groups to counter-protesters threatens everyone. It threatens all of our rights. We live in times where no one, including you, has the luxury of sitting on the sidelines. To do so is to be complicit in the atrocities that marginalized groups have confronted up until this day. As we enter into a new civil rights era, we must unapologetically fight for the rights of people from all faith backgrounds from varying ethnic and racial backgrounds, for women, for the LGBTQ plus community, for individuals with disabilities, for the young and the old, for economic mobility, and for the end of corporate greed plaguing this planet. So let's talk about what you guys can do next. First, have you guys considered running for office? Too many people at the margins count themselves out of this opportunity because they feel that the burden of overcoming bigotry and hate is heavier than getting the votes to win. This is especially true for atheists. To this excuse, I say that we need you to pave the way and set the example. And in my instance, and in the instance of State Senator Juan Mendez, we ran and we won. And also let me point out that this atheist here got the most votes in her primary and in the general election. <laughs> Voters care more about what your stances on issues are than they do about your religious pre preference. Also, please let me remind you who's in the White House, the bar set really low. You really have no excuse at this point. 
So let's say I haven't convinced you. So let's say you still don't want to run for office. Support a candidate whose values reflect your own. Keep an eye out for people who come from backgrounds and communities that are sorely missing in our government. While candidates need your financial support, so when they call you up for money, give them money, they also really need people who are willing to talk to voters regardless of whether it's hot or cold outside. In my primary, it was the dead of heat of summer where temperatures reached 110 degrees Fahrenheit, where we did the vast majority of our door knocking and talking to voters. And when you show up sweaty, dying of thirst at a voter's door, you definitely got their vote. Start fighting for the issues grounded in equality and equi equity. And start fighting for these issues because these are the values that you and hold near and dear to your heart as an atheist. Uh, and, and people need to see you out there fighting for these values, fighting for these issues, because it begins to break down the misconceptions of what an atheist is. When they see an atheist, when they see a, a secular individual, a humanist fighting for public education, they begin to realize that's no different than me. And that's powerful, and that's reshaping our narrative. And so get out there, talk to your elected representatives, let them know I am an atheist, I'm an agnostic, a humanist, I am your voter, and here are the issues that I care about. Because otherwise, if you aren't out there telling your story, if you aren't out there fighting for equality and equity and the public good, then you can safely assume that your elected officials are not thinking about you. So it's on all of us to take up this fight. And just know, I want to end on one note and then invite Senator Juan Mendez to come and speak. Just know that the future of our movement is intersectional. I cannot do this alone, and neither can you. But together, we can make a long-lasting positive change. It is a worthy use of our brief time on this earth. And thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And with that, I want to welcome Senator Juan Mendez. Thank you. Uh, I've been having an amazing time these last couple of days. I first, uh, one second, there we go. So I'm actually missing my Arizona weather. I'm way too cold right now. So my name is Juan Mendez. I'm one of the 30 state senators from Arizona. Uh, and today I'd like to speak about atheism and activism. Right? Uh, atheist activists have come a long way. We're now being invited to speak all across the country, not just to debate creationists at religious colleges or to talk to other atheists, but rather to address all kinds of groups and issues. Today is a totally different climate from our past. The non-theistic community is visible and valued. Today is just the right climate for people to hear what we have to say about non-belief. This climate exists because of the hard work and resources people in our movement invested nationally and in my state of Arizona and because of the personal and political risks taken by the brave women and men who advocated for inclusion before us. But so now, we now have a national platform, an opportunity, and I believe a responsibility to speak openly and authentically about our atheism in an engaging and inspiring way. While there remain many places where those of us who are atheists take a bold risk when we authentically declare who we are, the strength of our numbers, our passion for truth, the good character with which we conduct ourselves, and the value we offer to our communities, these things are no longer unnoticed. I'm absolutely certain we're going to achieve the kind of society in which equality and worth are not dependent on religious belief. Where labeling ourselves with the word atheist comes with a badge of respect, truth, and courage, rather than the stigma of self-righteousness and depravity. Where the, the free market place of ideas is finally free enough to receive the subversive notion that living in reality has merit, that seeking to understand our universe as it is, in all its beauty and harshness, is far more noble and empowering than letting superstition and fear dictate the course of human history and our own individual lives. 
where, where being open and honest about our atheism raises our esteem in the eyes of our friends, neighbors, family, and colleagues, rather than meeting with a social and political tax so high that many of us cannot bear it and instead choose to hide who we are. We are so close to this era of equality that the time for debating whether or not we get there is over. Our conversation must, must shift now to what roles and responsibilities we want for ourselves when we arrive, because it's time for us to take those on now. This shift, this shift will not end the, ne the necessity for the protest culture in which atheism has tr traditionally been rooted. We will continue to need bold instances on truth, uh, on the truth that underpins our freedom and autonomy. We will always need courageous leadership around challenges like climate change, poverty, and human rights. But, but we cannot meet those challenges if our solutions are grounded in religious fantasy rather than, the, rather than reality as we can best understand it. So atheism's protest culture has an essential role in our future, but the focal point of our protest must take seriously the plain fact that atheism's protest against theism will soon be outdated. So let's dream bigger. Let's go further than atheism. Let's think clearly about the world in which we find ourselves today, but comport ourselves knowing we're about to be leaders in a future where atheism will be the norm. The atheist worldview will be heard and taken seriously. What do we want to be saying when the world begins listening to us? Let's speak those words now. Who and what do we want to be advocating for when the whole world begins paying attention to our activism? Let's take on that activism now. How do we want to behave when those around us begin modeling our character? Right, let's conduct ourselves with that character now. We must boldly shape the future of atheism because eventually people are going to look around and notice there are atheists everywhere. What will they see? Our movement has a unique history of boldness and courage, of rejecting social norms that are incompatible with, society, with societal well-being, of encouraging all of us to refuse to write ourselves off or to accept a tyranny of the majority. And this history uniquely positions us to lead beyond atheism. When, uh, when Madeline, uh, when Madeline Murray O'Hare filed suit to end compulsory Bible readings and harassment at her son's school, her famous opening statement before the Supreme Court hinted at what I'm advocating for. She used protest language defining atheism in opposition to religious belief, but she went much further to talk about the vision atheists have for our lives. She's, I'm going to quote what she said, but uh, I'm amending some of it for gender-inclusive language. An atheist loves humanity instead of God. An atheist believes that heaven is something for which we should work now, here on earth, for all of us together to enjoy. An atheist believes that we, cannot, that we can get no help through prayer, but that we must find in ourselves the inner conviction and strength to meet life, to grapple with it, and to enjoy it. An atheist strives for involvement in life and not escape into death. We want women respected, poverty vanquished, war eliminated. We want an ethical way of life. We believe that we are our brother and our sister's keepers and, and keepers of our own lives, that we are responsible persons and the job is here and the time is now. Those words penned more than 50 years ago resonate even more powerfully today. There is no doubt that the time is now. With all the courage and strength that are the defining characteristics of free thought organizations, of all our other partner organizations, the time is now to truly take on the roles and responsibilities entitled, entailed in our atheism, to bring our brother and our sisters, to be uh, in, in being our brother and our sister's keeper and the keeper of our own lives. The time is now to fight even harder for the full realization of feminism. In 2017, it's appalling to witness time and time again women defend their humanity because of the simple fact that our society treats them as second-class citizens. We can and should do better. The time is now to vanquish the prison of poverty that crushes the human spirit, that distorts human perception around what is even possible for us and fragments the human family into distinct classes of privilege and want. The time is now to eliminate war, which is an insult to human in ingenuity a sickening waste of, human, of individual lives, of whole communities, destroyer of land, and destroyer of our best hopes for a future. The time is now to lead the movement into bold, in boldness toward the ethical way of life 
where we were responsible for a freer, fairer, more joyful world for ourselves and each other. I'm so grateful for the work the people here and before us have done to prepare for this great moment in history where that world is possible, where we are able to advance a message of reason, compassion, and equality, to build meaningful communities that are rooted in a love of the human experience rather than the hierarchical power schemes and superstitions. We're here to create a culture that makes it possible for me and other elected officials to talk honestly about our atheism. As people around us begin waking up to the reality that atheists are everywhere, as they begin seeing all of us here, let's make sure that they see strong champions of humanity. Let's make sure that they see activists for feminism, environmentalism, human dignity, and real liberty and justice for us all. Let's make sure we are conducting ourselves with character centered on safeguarding the infinitely precious dignity of all humanity. We are responsible persons. The job is here and the time is now. So thank you. You know, when I look at the two of them and I listen to them speak, it gives me so much hope that the composition of our current Congress will one day change. That we will have people like them in the halls of our Congress in Washington, D.C., because they're terrific. Absolutely. And the amount of courage for them to be open. You know how many open lawmakers we have in Washington, D.C., open atheist lawmakers? Zero. There are 535 members of Congress between the United States House of Representatives and the United States Senate, and there are zero. Thank you for being trailblazers. We have so much more work to do. While last year evil triumphed over good, and our fellow Americans elected a president who won on a campaign that was built on bigotry, xenophobia, racism, and sexism, we need to stay engaged to win. So I want to tell you that now is not the time to become discouraged. Since election night, and especially since the inauguration, we have watched as a lot of things that we care so deeply about have been turned backwards. We saw the president's cabinet stacked with religious zealots like Betsy DeVos, anti-LGBT bigots like Ben Carson, and of course, Jeff Beauregard Sessions as Attorney General. In 1986, he was deemed to be too racist to be a federal judge. 21 years later, he is now the chief law enforcement officer in the country. We saw the president issue an executive order imposing a thinly veiled religious test for entry into the United States. We saw him go out of a way, out of his way to support a Supreme Court judge who was the godfather of the court's Hobby Lobby decision, the single worst setback in women's reproductive health and in secularism in over a decade. We saw him order the end of DACA, the only program that protects 800,000 children in this country who came here with their parents. We saw him use the platform of the presidency not to condemn police brutality, but to condemn those athletes who were peacefully protesting it. And now, as I was mentioning before last week, his attorney general pr proudly and loudly stated that an individual's personal religious beliefs trump the civil rights and liberties of all Americans. His guiding principles on religious liberty effectively chills the constitutional protections that are guaranteed to all Americans. And that man should be ashamed. As bad as it is, and it is bad, right, we cannot afford to become discouraged. We must to continue to fight if we want to win. We have to stand up to our lawmakers here in this building behind you and in Washington, D.C., and in state houses across the country. We need to stand up to those lawmakers and to our fellow Americans
who have misplaced our nation's priorities so badly that just a week after the tragedy in Charlottesville, the president pardoned Joe Arpaio. That during a humanitarian crisis in Puerto Rico, our president takes to Twitter to attack, and, and the, these are black NFL players. We have to stand up to the president, the vice president, the cabinet, elected officials in Congress, elected officials across this country, and the religious right when they attempt to limit your civil rights and my civil rights in an effort to privilege their religion. We must fight each and every day to reclaim the true meaning of religious freedom. They have bastardized what that word means. They have bastardized it. We know it means freedom of and freedom from religion. And we must stand up for our secular values. Freedom, inclusion, equality, knowledge. Even at a time when we have a president who doesn't share our values. It is true that we are facing unprecedented challenges, but the unordinary times we live in present us each with an opportunity to be extraordinary. So I encourage you to do whatever it takes to be active, to be engaged, and to be extraordinary. And if that means you have to be angry, then be angry. This is still our country, and we have to reclaim who we are so that we can live up to the ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you all again for having me here today.